Running the occasional Windows app without cramping your Linux lifestyle, Snubs reports on this Hack 5 segment. This segment is brought to you by CrashPlan. So we all love Linux. It's one of my favorite operating systems by far, but depending on how you look at it, unfortunately it doesn't run everything. Now as much as we champion open source, the fact is that we still live in a Windows world, and for many of us, we must find a way to balance philosophy and reality. Now thankfully, there are some really nifty workarounds that will allow you to keep your sanity while running the occasional Windows program. Now I know, for example, that Darren, he really has a love-hate relationship with programs like Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere. I mean, come on, Adobe, really, you need to port your stuff. It's been way too long. Now today, I'm going to introduce you to several options to run Windows programs on your Linux machine or other workarounds that are similar to that. Now first and foremost is dual booting. While you won't be necessarily running programs in Linux, it does give you the option to use just one machine. Now you still have to pay for a Windows license and sacrifice some of your disk space, but at least when you do need to run a Windows program, it'll take full advantage of your computer's resources. Some like to call it bare metal as opposed to, say, a virtual machine. Now, this obvious annoyance here is the constant rebooting as you have to switch tasks, which can get really, really annoying. Now, if you, all you're looking to do is to get into the occasional LAN party game, this could be the best solution for you. Now, personally, I find it easiest when dual booting, uh, when building a dual booting machine, is to install Windows first and then Linux after that, since I'm a fan of Grub instead of the Windows equivalent. And second is remote desktop. If you have a spare machine on the network and you really can't beat the built-in remote desktop in Windows, it's called RDP or Remote Desktop Protocol. This has been a staple for sysadmins for years and the same can be true for most desktop users as well. Now plenty of remote desktop programs exist for Linux including the one called Remina Remote Desktop Client in Ubuntu. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to set up RDP on Windows and Linux. So I'm going to start on my Windows machine. You go over here to Computer under your Start menu, go to Properties, and then Advanced System Settings. Now from here, you want to go to Remote and allow Remote Assistant and connections from computers running any version of RDP. And that's the last tab. Allow connections from computers running any version of Remote Desktop. Click OK and then you're all set. Now the next thing you want to do is open Ramina RDP client in Ubuntu. So to do that, I'll just open up the dash, that's easy. Ramina desktop client, open that. And once it is open, you want to click on the new icon up here with the little plus sign and add your Windows machine's IP address. Now if you don't know that, this can be found on your Windows mach machine by going to uh, the command prompt and typing ipconfig. And I'm sure you guys already know how to do this, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> there we go. So once you find it from your uh, from ipconfig, you can go ahead and go back to Ramina on your Ubuntu desktop. And you want to go ahead and leave it as quick connect if you want. Type in the server IP address, the username and password. So for mine, I'll type those in. Oop, I think I spelled that wrong. I always spell things wrong when I'm on camera. And then you click OK a couple of times and you'll log in. And this should work. Client resolution, 256, connect, connecting, yes. OK, and it looks like it's working. There we go. Perfect. So now I am connected through Ramina Remote Desktop Client onto my Linux com computer from Windows. And also, don't do this over the internet because it's not really secure, so only do it if you're on the same network as both of your machines are. Now this isn't exactly a great solution for gaming and it might not be the best for streaming video over proprietary yet convenient platforms such as Netflix, but if you must run basic office or imaging applications, it's going to do the trick and it's quite well over a local network, so yeah, why not? Now number three is Crossover Linux. This emulator is a commercialized version of Wine, meaning you get a 14-day free trial and it's non-open source and it costs 60 bucks for one license, but I decided to try it anyway. Unlike dual booting or virtual machines, it doesn't require a Windows license, however you still need a license for the programs that you decide to run. It is supported right out of the box like for popular stuff like Office and Photoshop and 
i.e. if you ever wanted to run that on Linux, God, I hope not, but you'll need to buy those separately. So I tested this with IE since it's, you know, free, but I, I swear to God, I would never use this actually on my machine. So all I had to do was open Crossover Linux. And then I chose whatever applications I wanted to go ahead and install. Now it installs everything straight through the application, but once it is actually done, I'll do that later, you just go to your dash and you type in Internet Explorer and it gives you a brand new icon that you can open up and run it on your machine. So it's very easy to use, but again, it's 60 bucks and I don't necessarily want to spend that kind of money on a virtual machine for Internet Explorer. <laughs> now number four is running a virtual machine. VirtualBox and VMware are both very common choices for a virtual machine. I actually did a comparison of these two in hack tip number 14. Now these will enable you to run Windows operating system and programs in a window inside of Linux. This may not be a great choice if you're using a slower machine like an older generation i3 like this one or if you're looking to do some gaming. But if you have an updated computer that can process many tasks at once, this is a really good choice. Unlike like dual booting, you can easily switch between Linux and Windows apps because Windows will literally be running, running in a window. <laughs> How cute. Yeah, not really. All right, number five. This one is wine, and we all love to whine about wine. No, I'm just kidding. And also play on Linux. Uh, I talked about play on Linux in episode 1215 of Hack 5. We actually went really into detail about that and Wine and running Netflix off of Wine. It was actually a lot of fun. Now Wine stands for Wine is not an emulator, even though it kind of sort of is, but kind of isn't. And it enables you to run programs in Linux. And with over 20,000 programs said to work in Wine, I do suggest checking out their website for compatibility notes and more, and that's over at appdb.winehq.org. Play on Linux, which we also demoed in 1215, is a GUI front end for Wine. And I personally really like Play on Linux. It's very easy to use and it's lots of fun. Now my last one is Wubi, or a live CD. If you really want to keep your Windows machine and all of its programs, you can also install Ubuntu on a live CD or live USB and boot from your USB each time you want to run Linux. You just need to burn the ISO image to a disk and then run your USB whenever you want to boot into Linux. Now Wubi is a Windows installer for Ubuntu desktop. It'll let you install Ubuntu kind of like a program inside Windows. When you boot up from your computer, you have the option to boot into Linux or Windows. When it looks like a separate operating system, it's actually just using a file on your Windows partition. So now you know. You know all six of the different ways to get programs onto your Linux machine even though they don't necessarily work on there. And please don't use Internet Explorer because that's terrible. God, that's like, I don't know, that's like you're blasphemous, right? All right, so <laughs> there's a website online. It's called howtogeek.com. They have a great website for steps on some of these, not all of them, but quite a few of these different, uh, different how-tos that you can use personally for anything that you need to do. And let me know which items you prefer to do, which of the six steps is your favorite, and if you have any other ways to actually get into your Windows machine, if you need be, you can always email me at feedback at hack5.org, and we'll be right back after a quick break. I've been using CrashPlan for years, and I never thought I'd be this enthusiastic about backups, but let me tell you, these guys are doing it right. First of all, all of your data is yours and yours only, and that's why CrashPlan offers the best privacy guards. Using Bruce Schneier's open source Blowfish Cipher, you can generate and import your own private key so it never is stored on their servers. And what's more, CrashPlan is cross-platform. Try saying that, it's a cross-platform crash plan. Clients for Windows, Mac, Linux, even Solaris, you can see why I love it. And coupled with truly unlimited backups, I mean, seriously, I personally have a couple of terabytes up in the cloud that you can see why I'm so excited. And I, I also really love that they don't throttle. So, you know, you can actually get those terabytes up there with the bandwidth that you actually have. It's kind of fantastic. Uh, now, the fact that CrashPlan software is so flexible, it'll back up any file, not just to their offsite servers, but even to your own external hard drive. I use that in the van all the time, I love it. And to your computers, friends, get this for free. 
So as a hacker, as geeks, as IT professionals, we know the importance of offsite backups. And as Hack5 viewers, they're hooking us up with this really cool special deal. You get their one year unlimited plans that are normally uh, $59.99 a year, which is totally reasonable, about five bucks a month. But get this, because you're a Hack5 viewer and because they believe in this stuff, crashplan.com slash hack it up and you'll get 20% off. So that's, that's unlimited backup for less than four bucks a month. It is never too soon to back it up. So I highly encourage you guys to take advantage of this special offer at crashplan.com slash hack it up. And also stay tuned for a very special webinar live. Uh, I'm gonna be partaking with Crashplan on August 29th. So just stay tuned to twitter.com slash crashplan. It's time for the Technolest photo of the week, and this photo is from Sudo. Now, he said Yasuger doesn't always fly, but when he does, he goes first class. Maybe he has some Jack and Coke. Maybe catches up on his backlog of Hack 5 podcasts. Maybe gets belligerent to the in-flight wireless users. Maybe plays some Sudoku. Yasuger is unpredictable like that. Yasaga. <laughs> I love this photo, that's really cool, and it's kind of awesome to see you using a Wi-Fi pineapple on a plane. So thank you so much, Sudo, for sharing that with us. And you can always email your photos to feedback at hack5.org and use the subject line technolest so that we can find them super easy and show them next week.